Now, after Austria falls to Germany, we also lose Poland, Ukraine, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, and most importantly for the art world, France falls. In 1939, it's museum administrators who give the call to begin evacuation of the Louvre. And within a matter of moments, the Louvre ceases to become a museum and instead becomes a gigantic packing house. As you can see uh, in this image, all these artworks are taken down from the walls, removed from their frames, and basically packed in, her in horrific conditions. Uh, having to be done super quick and then taken out to trucks that will take these artworks out into the French countryside uh, for safekeeping. And some of these artworks are absolutely gigantic. For instance, uh, this artwork here you can see is uh, six, seven, eight people loading this work up. Now this is a, a fairly famous painting by Rubens called the uh, called Maria de' Medici arriving in Marseille. And she is uh, the regent of, of France. She's Italian, comes from the very famous Medici family. You can see the, the Medici coat of arms here. And uh, she's married the king of France. He passes away and she is coming here to serve basically as queen, as regent. And this series of paintings that she has Rubens complete uh, basically uh, serve as her justification for being in charge of the country that she's not really a member of. And I think there are about 23 paintings done in that series. Now the victory of Samothrace, as we've talked about before, uh, sits atop the grand staircase of the Louvre and this is not one solid object that is only like missing its head. It is uh, made up of thousands of pieces that were put back together when she was found. And um, the curator of sculptures was like so concerned with this artwork being moved, thinking it would just collapse back into those many pieces. But fortunately, with the bracing that you can see was done here, um, she survived not only the trip out of the Louvre, but also back in. The Mona Lisa, she gets special treatment everywhere she goes. Um, she was placed into a climate-controlled ambulance and driven off through the streets of Paris. In fact, we don't really have any true documentation as to what happened to her uh, between 1939 and 1945 when she's taken down and then placed back on the walls of the Louvre. But Nazis were pretty smart, and they would find these hiding places that the French took their art to. And when you got a, when you had a famous painting such as Vermeer's Astronomer, uh, this is a painting that Hitler would have wanted for his private collection. He would really have gotten first crack at it. It would be sent to him. If he didn't want it, it would go down to uh, Goering or Goebel, and then so on down to the point where if no one wanted it, they would have placed it in the Führer Museum that was going to be planned for uh, Linz, Austria, which is uh, Hitler's hometown. Now, after France, it was Poland that had Europe's most finest art collection. And this is uh, Da Vinci's Lady with an Ermine. She was taken uh, out to a country house and placed in the basement, walled up with a whole bunch of gold artifacts. and. The Nazis saw the comings and goings of the workmen. They uh, broke into the house, found the basement that had a newly constructed wall, tore down the wall, and then um, took all the gold artifacts. They left the painting. In fact, they tossed the painting aside so that there was a uh, boot print on its surface. They had walked on it, not thinking it was of any value. This painting by Raphael is one of, uh, in fact, it is the most missed art treasures of World War II. Um, this is uh, by Raphael. It is, uh, he's the third greatest Renaissance artist behind Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. Um, 
Raphael's work is uh, very highly sought after, and it's just called Portrait of a Young Man. The last time anyone saw it was in January of 1945 in the possession of the Nazi governor of Poland, and it has not been seen since. It is uh, still maintains the most uh, important artwork lost from the war. Now, if we fast forward to 2012, this article is published in the art newspaper, and it states that the painting has been found, that it was in a bank vault. However, um, no further news has come from it. It's been five years already, um, and so we're not quite sure if this is a hoax or uh, just perhaps they need more time uncovering it or doing research, but um, it, it still remains lost to this day. Now, the Nazis were a smart bunch of people. They were hiding artworks because they honestly thought that they were going to come back for them. Um, most of the artworks were taken to the Bavarian Alps and placed in castles or chateaus as this one. Uh, which is the castle Narschwanstein, and inside of it was just tons and tons of stolen art. In fact, if you look at all the art that was stolen by the Nazis during the war, it would amount to over 27 billion, with a B, uh, billion dollars worth of art. Another place where they took art were uh, down into the salt mines in Austria, and these paintings at the top, uh, they were found from that hoard, uh, as were these works here, um, buried uh, about a mile in the ground. And there was this just cavernous room that had all this art uh, basically stored. And it was also rigged with explosives to go off if anyone entered the room or disturbed the art. By the time this room was emptied, uh, it had filled up 88 train cars worth of uh, space. Uh, this image I like the, the best because it contains uh, panels of the Ghent altarpiece. This is the, uh, the Mystic Lamb, which is kind of the main bottom image of the altarpiece. We have an image of Eve uh, and some singers that are visible here. Um, off here, uh, we've got the Ghent altarpiece put back together. Uh, the Ghent altarpiece is really a unique work because it is so massive. It is uh, about 15 and uh, a half feet wide. It's 11 feet tall and it weighs over a ton. It's got a neat distinction in that it is uh, literally the most often stolen work of art ever produced. Stolen 13 times in its uh, 600 year existence. Uh, by the time the war was over, again, the Nazis had stolen about $27 billion worth of art, and there still remains uh, about 100,000 artworks unaccounted for from the war. Now, we're going to take a few minutes and take a look at some art thieves that are very, very famous. Uh, Thomas Bruce, for instance, he is also known as, and more widely known as, Lord Elgin. Uh, the British ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, who in 1801 uh, gains permission from the Ottoman authorities to purchase half of the remaining sculptures off of the Parthenon. And this is the, the Greek Parthenon here and up in the uh, pediments, which is this area here. This would have been a sculptural area, for instance. And when we look at the artworks that are taken, we can definitely see how they would fit into that type of uh, space because they're at a, very much a diagonal. Now, Lord Elgin takes these, what we now call the Elgin Marbles, back to the British Museum. And in around 1830, 1832, the Ottoman Empire uh, falls uh, back to the Greeks, and the Greeks ask for these artworks back. They say they were stolen, uh, improperly sold, and they would like their return. Um, they're still waiting for that return nearly 200 years later, and the British Museum has no interest at all in returning these. Uh, they say that they truly bought them fair and square and actually probably preserved them from any further damage, which may be true. But 
Uh, they also say that if they begin to repatriate objects such as the Elgin marbles, uh, there is going to be a never-ending list of works that need to be returned. Um, for instance, these plaques are from the uh, country of Nigeria, and during the 1857 punitive expedition, uh, the royal house or the royal um, home was looted, and 3,000 of these brass plaques were taken. Uh, 200 of them exist at the British Museum today. Adam Worth, he was a head of a criminal syndicate in London at the end of the Victorian age, and his brother John had been imprisoned, so Adam decides he needs a bargaining chip to spring his brother out of jail. So what he does is he takes his two bodyguards to Talmus Agnew and Sons auction house, and in the middle of the night he is uh, hoisted up through an open window, in the darkness, he finds this painting, which is called The Duchess of Devonshire. It's a beautiful painting by Gainsborough, and he cuts the painting from its frame, rolls it up, and he and his bodyguards take off uh, into the night. Now, his brother John gets out of jail by totally legal means. However, instead of returning the painting, Adam Worth says he is entranced by this woman's beauty, and he sleeps with it under his bed. Vincenzo Perugia, a carpenter, and on a Monday morning in August of 1911, he steps out of a storage closet in the Louvre where he had been hiding, and he walks over and steals the most famous painting of all time. He does something that uh, Hitler was unable to do. Uh, he steals the Mona Lisa, and um, it's even a little bit more embarrassing for the Louvre because she's gone about four hours before anyone calls the police. Um, they think she's in conservation or in photography. Um, however, she wasn't. Uh, basically, he walks out the front door with it, and it's gone for about two years. He, um, Vincenzo Perugia gets caught by trying to sell the Mona Lisa to an undercover police officer in 1913. At his trial, he says that he's an Italian patriot just trying to return back all the Italian masterpieces that uh, Napoleon had stolen during his wars. And uh, while that's true, the, that France has a lot of uh, Italy's artwork that was stolen by Napoleon, uh, the Mona Lisa wasn't. It was actually sold to King Francis I of France uh, directly by the artist himself, Leonardo da Vinci. So um, it's kind of unique, too, that after the Mona Lisa is sold to King Francis I, that's where da Vinci ends up living. He lives within the court of that king. And um, this is where I'm going to stop for this segment of the video. We're going to go to uh, the next part, uh, part four, and we'll finish up art theft.